I'm glad that you all decided to join us for our Sunday school. <clears throat> it's been a pretty busy day, I know, with being able to possibly you've driven out to church. And the, we've had our <clears throat> drive in church, Lord willing. <laughs> Everything went well. And so <clears throat> we're going to have a Sunday school class. And over the next, the course of the next few weeks as we do this, I'm planning on having a short little Bible study on every Sunday night, just uh, kind of into the week. You might even take it to, it's going to be available on Sunday night for the next few weeks, but if you want to watch it whenever you want to, it's just another opportunity for you to be able to be a part of our studies here at the church. And I hope it blesses you and your family <clears throat> as well. And, and like I said, there are going to be some short, shorter Bible studies and kind of a, maybe just a, a time for you to sit down and get your Bible out and look at some of the things we've been studying. What I'm going to do for the next few weeks as we go through this Sunday school class is I'm going to be taking, <clears throat> you know, this is going to coincide with my Wednesday night Bible study in the book of Luke. And we have reached in that passage one of the longest answers that Jesus ever gave to a question. And it uh, talks about the second coming. And this is kind of an addendum to this. This is going to be an addendum for the next few weeks that will fit with our Sunday school class. Our Sunday school class on a Wednesday night will work together. So if you're watching on Wednesday night and you want a little bit of extra information, you can watch the Sunday school. If you are watching the Sunday school class and, and you want some more information, go to Wednesday night. Hopefully, you're doing both because they'll fit together very well. And as we get ready to begin here, I want to, for sure, um, ask you to pray for all those that possible uh, COVID-19 in our county, but also for the nation as they make decisions. Pray for those that are sick. Pray for those that are making decisions. Pray for the church as we, again, put our minds together to see what the Lord is calling us to do during this time. But especially just continue to pray for not only the country, but just the world in general, what's going on around us, and that God will bless in those ways. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do, and I, I praise you for being here tonight, and I pray that you would just help us as we study your word, that we'll be encouraged. Encouraged, Lord, knowing that you're in control, and we give you praise for that. It's in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. I, I, once again, this study that we're going to be talking about on Sunday School is certainly to go along with Charles' overview of Revelation. It's going to be taken chapter 21, or, or chapter uh, 19, I'm sorry, of Revelation. We're going to be talking about it. <clears throat> and it also would fit my Luke study. So Revelation chapter 19, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. And I want you to open it to, uh, looking at verses 11 to 16. And we'll, we'll break this down quite a bit as we go through this. But I want to begin by kind of giving you a thought here that might help you. <clears throat> you know, several views of Revelation and the end of times. And, and I know that some would agree with what I would say would be my view. Others might not agree with that. But, but generally, when we start talking about some of these, there's three pretty prominent views. One is a post-millennial view, and it is that um, things get better, and that uh, this is after the millennial. We just kind of work our way into the kingdom of God. That's post-millennial. Things are getting better and better. I talked a little bit about that <clears throat> on Wednesday night Bible study. Another one is an all-millennial view that there is a this is a kingdom is spiritualized during that view. Everything's spiritualized, and then there's a premillennial view that is that we are before the millennial kingdom and <clears throat> it's going to be a seven years tribulation and the Lord's going to come back but we're going to be raptured out before that so <clears throat> one of the reasons you know I, I've come to the view that I kind of sit with is because as you read through the book of Daniel you'll see that very clearly that in Daniel the things that happened although they were in apocryphic language that, that kind of gives you these beast visions they always represented something, and, and they represented different kingdoms, different world uh, kingdoms, 
And you see that, <clears throat> even though it was, in, in a sense, the, the, the language that, that shows these beasts out there, they, they were certainly true kingdoms. And so there was, and then you, you go to the, you know, the weeks of Daniel, and you start seeing that the 69th week and where the Messiah was cut off, and, and it's perfectly to the time that Daniel talks about that Christ comes into his last week, and that's pretty much what we've been talking about, Luke, the 69th week, and Jesus begins uh, a question that as he began to talk about it was, you know, when will the end of time, what, when will this all come about? When will you set up your kingdom? That's what the apostles want to know. That's what we are still want to know today. If you go into the Wednesday night and you go back and talk, especially look at the last week and the week before that, we talked about an introduction to that passage. You'll understand why, you know, these, this, as we put this all together, that this last week is so important because it's the 69th week of Daniel. And there's one more seven year week left in there. And so it kind of gives you, you know, the fact of the matter is, is Daniel, literally, the things that happened in Daniel were literal. And so you can't spiritualize everything. And I think it's the same way in Revelation. I believe there's a lot of literal stuff in there that is hard for you to spiritualize. But, but I want to kind of go through that. And so you kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. These are things that are going to happen uh, in the week, what we would call the seven-year tribulation. And this is what this is in this passage. This is really the end of that, the culmination of it all, okay? But let's read that, verse 11, and let's start there. And one thing I'll say <laughs> as I begin this, one of the reasons why <clears throat> I want to cut these short, you know, some of the things, and Charles mentioned this as well, you know, our Sunday school classes have a lot of discussion. And, and it, it is makes a whole lot it makes to me it it makes more the class go faster in a sense it makes it more interesting you're not sitting there listening to someone lecture <clears throat> generally you know sometimes I, I get a little uptight because whenever I am teaching sometimes I, I do have people uh, that have days where no one says anything and I usually mention that if you've been in my classes you know that I don't like that I like people to talk I like to find out but whenever we do these classes like this, this is straight out lecture time. And there is no back and forth discussion. There's no questions in that way. So this is one of the reasons why I shorten this. <clears throat> but if you want to turn in your Bibles or get on your phone, look at chapter 19, Revelation, we'll begin verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse and he who sat upon it is called faithful and true, in, and faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he has the name written upon him which no one knows except himself. And when he is, uh, and and he is clothed with a robe dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he might smite the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The next week, as I begin this, I'm going to show you a picture. My sister, Mary Jane, painted me a picture of this. And it was the picture of that white horse, Christ on it, with that written on his thigh. Anyway, it's a very cool picture, and I've treasured that pretty much ever since I got it. But anyway, I'll show you that picture next week. But it is incredible. And, you know, as, as you read this, this is tremendously graphic. A powerful description of Jesus Christ portrays him uh, in, this, in the vision the Apostle John had of the glorious second coming of Christ. You know, often I'm asked the question, and I guess that, uh, <laughs> you know, as a preacher, uh, one who looks at scriptures, 
they often will say to me, well, things uh, in our troubled war world ever get better? Are things going to get better or are they ever going to get worse? And I'll just tell you, it's, it's just going to continue to get worse and worse. Or is it, in a sense, going to be to get better? It's kind of interesting because I'm going to answer this question <laughs> maybe a, a little odd what you think. Yes, the world is going to get better. <laughs> uh, it's going to get better. There's no question about it. And so, yes, uh, when you ask me, will the world get better? But that yes is directly associated with the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm going to answer that for. You know, as far as the world we're living in today, yes, this corrupt things are getting worse and worse. But someday it's going to get better. Okay. And that, that alone is what's going to remedy the problems of the world. We're not going to get the world problems fixed by, you know, sociology. We're not going to get the world's situations fixed on education or anything that is man-made. Okay? And that is Christ, and Christ alone is what's going to bring peace instead of war. Justice instead of iniquity, righteousness instead of wickedness. That's just the way it is. Jesus will, will come and he will rule uh, this world someday. He is, uh, <clears throat> he is going to return to be the king and he's going to establish his kingdom. Now, this particular passage, which we, we just read, prophesies the greatest of all moments in history. Greatest of all moments in history. And it is the... In, it's the redemption that we've been talking about. You know, I've, I've said this, the scheme of redemption from the, from the very beginning. <clears throat> this is all culminating. And it really is true. Whenever you have the Word of God, we know the beginning of the world. We know the end of the world. <clears throat> Some of the questions that men have asked for eons from the beginning of time, as they ask, you know, um, how did I get here? What am I supposed to do while I'm here? And what happens when we die? <clears throat> you know, these are all answered in the Word of God. But not only just personally, why are you here? And how we got here? And personally, when, you know, it's, it's answers to question to for all of creation, all of mankind. All of this is all about the beginning God created the world. He tells us how we are to live. He sent Jesus Christ, His Son, to die on the cross for us. And He gives us the book of Revelation to show us at the end how it's going to be, okay? <clears throat> so, no doubt about it, as you learn uh, as from different times that we've studied through Revelation, different times, you know, from Charles, you went through Revelation. I've, I've taught a couple times a jet trip through Revelation. <clears throat> it's an interesting quick run through the book of Revelation. It's an interesting study as well. It takes about an hour, hour and a half to go, you know, jet through it like that in that way but as you've gone through that you know you 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 understand that in the study of the book of revelation as you've studied over time this event will not happen this last chapter verse 19 or, or chapter 19 not the last chapter but this last part of this this not is not going to happen without some preliminary hostilities of a far-reaching nature you know, this last Wednesday night we talked about in the book of Luke, we talked about earthquakes, and we, we started talking about there will be multiple earthquakes, kind of like birth pains. They get, there's a little bit, and it gets worse and worse and worse. Well, we've saw, we've seen that. Now, I was just talking to one of our brothers in, in the church here just today, and, and him and I were talking about some of the things, and, and I, I'll just tell you, whenever I looked at that, the facts about the earthquakes and how many people have died in earthquakes? It's staggering. Next Wednesday night, we're going to talk about things that people have died in the plagues. And you're going to look at some of that and, and just be blown up, blown away by how things have, you know, gotten. Uh, the, we've always had plagues. We've always had earthquakes. But now we're having more and more and more. And they affect so many people. But anyway, prior to the return of Jesus Christ, there will be a worldwide hostility uh, generated by Satan and his demons and by wicked men that, that's going to be incredible. Worldwide hostility generated also, I believe, by God himself who pours out his wrath. 
I mean, we, we you know, you kind of learn about the efforts of Satan during the coming uh, tribulation. You, you kind of read that as you go through the book of Revelation. You learn about the identity of the Antichrist and his cohorts that is called the false prophet. You learn that in Revelation. And you learn about the demons that are going to be, be released to overland the world. You learn about the escalating wickedness of men in the midst of the outpouring of the fury of the wrath of God. And they continue not, you would think with the wrath of God coming, that people would get better. But they, they continue to become more and more wicked and more and more obstinate and harder and harder uh, and more resistant uh, uh, against the gospel. That's what happens in Revelation. You would think it'd just be the opposite. You know, it's interesting. Today I was looking at uh, one of the things that uh, during this time where, you know, even COVID-19, when we should really be, you know, in, in a sense, these are all wake-up calls in the sense that, you know, life isn't sure. There's no guarantee for tomorrow. And yet liquor sales has gone up. Incredible, you know, it's 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 like staggering gone up. Well, you know, that's not the answer to peace. Our answer is in God. Our answer is hope in Christ. That's the answer. And instead of becoming, you know, where we, you know, give ourselves over to temptations of drunkenness, we should be giving ourselves over to the Holy Spirit in our lives and really trying and striving to be better than we are. Not for earning salvation, but because we want to be faithful to our God. But as we go through this, you're going to find out that, you know, that the, the forces of heaven and the forces of hell are going to meet in a final fury, and that's in this chapter, okay? It's involving the nations of the world in a battle uh, that we know as Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. And I'll just tell you, this is going to be an incredible battle. And this, pa this passage talks about this. Okay, we, you know, down in uh, verse 19, it says, And I saw a beast and the king of the earth and their armies assembling to make war against him who sat upon the horse and against his army. Revelation 16, 16, that great focal point of the battle will be a place called in the Hebrew language, Megeton, Har Megeton. And, and so it's, it's not without a tremendous amount of hostility, far beyond what we have seen Yet in our world, which, you know, going to be more than that. And it's going to, uh, when you ask the question, are things going to get better? And the question can be answered both ways. Well, yes and no. Yes, it's going to get better because when Jesus Christ comes, that is the cataclysmic moment of redemptive history. That's when it's going to be over, okay? And before they get better, though, I'm going to tell you, they're going to get worse, lots worse, even more than what we see today. I mean, the world hasn't even begun to understand how bad life can be. And we kind of get in some weird things going on. You know, I, I, I think that sometimes we, we would say, you know, this COVID-19 has been a real, I don't know, wake up in a sense that, boy, look what could happen in this world, just like that. I mean, but... Um, Compared to what's going on in the seven-year tribulation, it's nothing, okay? Uh, there is going to be, uh, you know, life is going, can get worse in that case, okay? Uh, we, we don't know. The world hasn't begun to understand how bad it can get <laughs> in the sense that, you know, how terrifying. Uh, as terrifying as things are today, it's going to be incredibly more terrifying uh, it's, you know, it's very unjust today. It's going to be more unjust. It's going to be chaotic beyond even our wildest imagination. And if you want to understand that, uh, understand the book of Revelation. In chapter 6, it begins to unfold, okay? It's an unfolding of, of the judgments of God. There's the seven seal judgment, and then there's the seven trumpet judgment, and the seven bowls of wrath. They culminate in, in uh, uh, really, that is called the the, the final day of wrath. The, it is described as us as really the, you know, the, the final culmination. But uh, before the world gets better, uh, in the return of Jesus Christ, it's going to get far, far worse, is what I'm trying to say. And, and then there's going to be a great moment of redemptive culmination in Jesus Christ uh, when he comes 
uh, into the world and immediately uh, we begin to regain that paradise lost. Now, uh, as you come to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, uh, you see Jesus Christ is describing for us uh, what, uh, you know, and in, in, in you think about in the prior passage of this, uh, in the prior passage there was a presentation of a, of a great event called, in verse 9, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now that's when the, the Christ will join uh, with the redeemed people and they will participate in this mar wonderful marriage supper of the Lamb. I can't even imagine what this is going to be like, but I can't wait for that to happen. Okay, it is a, uh, a supper that in its fullness will be enjoyed in the time of the millennial kingdom. Uh, the thousand year reign with Christ when he establishes that on earth. And, but the marriage supper of the Lamb, as wonderful as it is, it's when the Lamb gathers his bride and they enter into this glorious kingdom um, and participate in this wonderful time of celebration. Before the marriage supper can come to pass, the warrior king must have a final battle. He cannot, in a sense, take his bride into the kingdom. He cannot establish the great event and the marriage supper, uh, the great uh, celebration that's there and, until he wins this great victory, which he's going to do, okay? And so there's an anticipation of this great event of the marriage supper of the Lamb, the final great event of the kingdom. And, and it is the time that uh, the greatest amassing of armies come against the Lord Jesus Christ and for now you know the the demons have been loosed and those that are bound have been loosed all this is happening you know we see numbers like 200 million demons and that they're there 200 million that are in this army uh, that have been released and the host of hell this formidable battle is going to be taking place and you have what is left of humanity on earth that hasn't been destroyed uh, under the power of the Antichrist, destroyed by the crazy judgments of God, you know, in, in that sense. And they gather together these great armies and they're led into the fields of Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon and, and basically, they, the, this valley stretches all the way into the south, past Jerusalem. And I, I'll tell you, it is incredible when you start thinking about it in your mind. So, the greatest of all human holocaust. Uh, is commonly known uh, the great holocaust of Armageddon. And before the king can take his bride to the celebration, he makes a final triumph. All right, now, very daring for the Antichrist to do this because, you know, you're fighting against the king of kings and lord of lords. But as you come to that again in chapter 19, verse 11, Babylon, the great city, uh, empire of the Antichrist, has really been destroyed. Uh, the world economy, uh, economy and the religious systems have been devastated. Uh, the empire of the Antichrist is in shambles. And, you know, you kind of look at that from chapter 17 and 18. The seven sealed judgments have been, been opened and fulfilled. The seven trumpets have been blown. And the furious judgment was unfolded from that. And then the seven bowls of wrath have been poured out. Man's day is about to end and the great tribulation will be over. Satan's time as, as well has ended as Jesus Christ comes in glorious uh, triumph. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. It, it would do justice um, to the intent of scriptures and to the anticipation of all the redemption literature that is before us in the Bible um, if, if we didn't say, kind of at this point as we begin, this is a culmination of God's plan that his people have been waiting for throughout all redemption history. This is it, chapter 19, okay? And this is, which has been anticipated since the very beginning. This has really kind of been the sense. Remember when Jesus, uh, you know, or actually go all the way back into the garden, you have Satan's head being uh, uh, bruised. Uh, it, back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, this is the time when the scepter is given to the true king that, that goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 49. This is also, for example, the anticipation of the great prophecy of 2 Samuel chapter 7 when David is told there's going to come a king and there's going to come a king greater than any other king, a king who will be the son of David who will establish the kingdom 
uh, that will last forever. This is it, okay? It's the second Samuel 7 then is anticipation of the very event that's described for us here in Revelation chapter 19, which kind of makes it an exciting thought when you begin there. It's very the very anticipation of this day and, and the moment that was uh, certainly in the heart of Isaiah whenever he told about the fact that he was going to come, uh, there was going to come a great servant king, one who would be would establish his throne and his kingdom uh, as well. So Isaiah anticipates this event in the 11th chapter and again in the 42nd chapter. This anticipate this was anticipated by Ezekiel. This was anticipated by Joel. Okay, it was um, is anticipated by Zechariah in chapter 14. Certainly Isaiah had this in mind in chapter 9 when he says the government will be upon his shoulders. You see, he talked about a, a child who would come, who would reign and rule. So what I'm trying to say is the Old Testament also pointed out the, the very clearly that the center of this kingdom, uh, which the Messiah would establish, would be uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Clearly the prophet Zechariah said, let it be known that Jerusalem was the place. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3, it shall come about in that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people and who... Uh, Lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. In the battle of Armageddon, uh, there's a focal point as well at Jerusalem. Uh, and Jerusalem is going to be a place, of course, where the Antichrist establishes rule. Uh, this is where he's going to be. He sets up the center of his false worship there in the, in the, uh, in the city of Jerusalem, in, in, in a sense, in that sense. And, and basically, uh, the, the conflict will hit the city as well. Zechariah talked about this. Even Isaiah talked about this in chapter 9, verse 7. So all the prophets were anticipating what was going to happen. But there would come a day when Jerusalem would be a place of judgment. There would come a day when God would send his great king to establish his eternal kingdom. And though they didn't fully have the, the revelation, of course... They had to wait till the New Testament, even uh, gave it a, a greater revelation, uh, which is, we saw that in all, all of that discourse that we're talking about now, okay? Uh, and we understand that human history has finally reached its culmination, okay? There would come from heaven the anointed one, the son of David, the promised king who would dethrone the kings of the world and establish his kingdom of righteousness in which the people would be lifted up and exalted. Peace, justice would prevail in the world. Certainly Isaiah, as well as other prophets, knew that uh, and understood um, that. They would understood that this was going to be a great event. So this conflict is set. And, and we understand it uh, because you look in the book of Revelation, you get that. And so the anticipation is set. The Christians have longed for this day to come. And, you know, as you, you, know, you think back, as we, you think about when you look at Revelation 13, I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 13, when the Lord is uh, early in his ministry, began to talk about what was going to happen in the future. In chapter 13 of Matthew, verses 41 and 42, he said this, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out his kingdom, all the stumbling uh, blocks and those who commit lawlessness and cast them into the furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, but the righteous will shine forever as a sun in the kingdom of their father. Here Jesus is saying there's coming a day of judgment. There's coming a day when <clears throat> there's going to be a judgment. But here's the thing. It's going to be a day of blessing because finally justice, finally we, we see that, that God is going to, <clears throat> we're going to shine in the sense the kingdom is going to shine forever. And the great the discourse that we're studying about in the passage in Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 24 and 25, uh, you know, Jesus preached a sermon on his own second coming and he reminds uh, again of what is going to happen as you go from 24 of Matthew to chapter 25. And he says this, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. But on the other hand, he says this, Enter into the kingdom. Come, you who are blessed in my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. 
And so that day is going to be a day of tremendous judgment. But also it's going to be a day of tremendous blessing. Okay? And, and really this, what I want to get across through this as well is that our hope is in Christ. Our hope has always been in Christ. It has been in hope. Our hope has been in Christ from the day that uh, we were born till the day that we die. That's our hope. That's the hope of the world. So we have to share that with people as well. And so it is a, this event is going to be great judgment, but it also says it's going to be great blessing. Okay. And the believers throughout the ages have anticipated this moment. And, and I'll just say, you know, maybe it's, I, I hope it's close, you know. You know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 tells us about the day that the Lord is going to be revealed from heaven. And this is the day that we're looking at in Revelation 19. That's the point. This is a this is what it is pointing to. This is the day, if you want to say it that way. So it's an anticipation of the saints of the Old Testament. It's an anticipation of the day of the saints of the New Testament, the day of judgment. And it's kind of what, you know, as you read John, as it began to. You know, take this, put it in your mouth, eat it. Remember that? It was real sweet when he ate it, but when he got in his stomach, it made his stomach get upset. It is sweet because Christ is coming. Uh, bitterness because it meant damnation for the ungodly. Um, and that was it. And that, that's kind of my point about all things. You know, we're, we're excited about the Lord return. But folks, we've got to let people know because he is going to return, because things are getting close. And, you know, this is one of those natural signs that the Lord uses to say, man, we need to get ready. And I'm just hoping that, that you know some that, that you, if you know somebody, not hoping that you know someone that's not saved, but hoping that you, if you do know somebody that's not saved, hoping that you will tell them about this great hope we have in Christ. Because that's the hope of all the ages. It has been from the very beginning to the very end. Okay. This is a culminating event. This is a final event. It's the end of the whole saga, really. This is the end of the, the scheme of redemption that is there, okay? So here's the thing. We should be loving this event. I, I can't wait for the event of the Lord coming. We should be anticipating this event. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 8, In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you get that? Do you love his appearing? Okay. If so, he defines a Christian as someone who loves the appearing of uh, Jesus Christ. Now think about this. When you think about it, okay, we're going to close with this. But when you think about this, when you contemplate this, uh, you know, of course we do as Christians. I love, I mean... Uh, I'm trying to get Alex to shake his head with me here. <laughs> Aren't you glad that he's going to return? Okay. But certainly, sometimes we don't demonstrate a kind of affection because why? We get so caught up in the world around us. Now, you know, up until the last few months, I would say that most of us would probably say we're absolutely satisfied with living in this world, in a sense, uh, for the most part. Okay. Uh, all of us, if we are honest and we look into our hearts and the question is asked, would you rather leave this world and be taken to glory or would you rather that Jesus come and, or, uh, and, or, or would you rather keep on enjoying life? Uh, I think maybe some people would be hard pressed to honestly say, you know, it is clear cut. I would in one split second give up everything in this world for the presence of Jesus Christ. You hear that? You know, so the question, do you love his appearing? I'm hoping that as we go through this study and we, and you know, we continue in, in this studying of Luke and then studying Revelation, we're going to bounce back and forth there a little bit. I'm hoping that we will get to the point where we love his appearing. We can't wait to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that's probably tough. You know, I, I love the idea of the Lord returning. <clears throat> I, I, you know, I think it's close. I, but I, I said that from the very beginning. I, I said that in 30 years ago when I began here at Elm Branch, I thought it was close. <laughs> you know, and I still believe it is. <clears throat> and I say that because, you know, we need to be ready. 
we need to be ready. So I just want to encourage you to continue with this, uh, with us in the study, but, but be praying for all those around us. And again, stay in the Word of God and grow in your faith as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to study your Word. I pray, Father, you'll help us as we study this, that it will be an encouragement to us. An encouragement to do what you, uh, do what you ask us to do and to continue to be faithful to you. And also encourage us as we study this to, to be willing to talk to people about the greatest hope that has ever, ever been offered to mankind. And that is that your son, Jesus Christ, came, died on the cross so that we might have forgiveness of sins. We give you praise and pray that you would just be with this, <clears throat> that the people that are sick in this community and, and in this world around us, and Lord, I pray that you would just continue to help them and heal them. And help us, Lord, that we continue to get out this glorious word that you are who you are and that you care so much for us. We give you praise. For it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.